So we've talked about the skin, we've talked about the joints, but the one thing I wanted to throw in there is the itch. The itch. I mean, do we have Signs formal and symptoms? I know. Signs and we symptoms. have formal questionnaires, and and we can use those, or you can use the partner questionnaire. You ask the person sitting next to them in your office, their partner, their spouse, their their girlfriend, and you know you can ask the patient. You know, does this bother? Does it itch? No. And then the partner says, "You keep me up all night, yeah. scratching and itching," or "I vacuum the bed sheets." because you scratch all night. So I just wanted to throw in itch is an incredibly powerful thing that can be distractful. You may not be able to focus at work because you're not sleeping or your spouse is. So itch is one of the things I think that drops off the radar. And we Thank used you. to say that psoriasis didn't itch and one of the ways, I was actually trained by one of the uh, most brilliant people in the psoriasis community and I well remember in the late 80s and in the 90s telling patients psoriasis doesn't itch eczema itches and that's one of the differentiators not just the location but the pink scaly patches that itch you um, would they would complain about the bleeding they would complain about the flaking they would complain about soreness but when we started asking patients what are your biggest complaints about the signs and symptoms of disease itch and pain came up as number one and number two. Mm -hmm. We're terrible in dermatology with pain. We'll just admit that. And no, everyone's afraid to manage pain now. But usually with pain, if skin, if pain hurts, um, pain hurts, that's kind mm -hmm. of an oxymoron. If you have pain and you're hurting in some way, there are some things that you can do. And unfortunately, sometimes people will abuse substances trying to get relief from their pain or including prescription pain meds or other things, but itch, we're just now starting to talk about itch in right, dermatology right, and what a right, miserable, right, miserable right. experience it is to be itchy and scratchy. Let all me the time. give you an example. I had a patient who had severe plaque psoriasis, severe plaque psoriasis. He actually became erythrodermic with about 80% of his body. And he went to see his provider, and nobody, nobody, they kept giving him topicals or uh, prednisone here and there. He came to us in such severe distress that I'll never forget it. He looked up, he was sitting on the bed and he looked up at me and he said, if you cannot fix this itch, I will kill myself. Mm -hmm. I think that's very impactful mm -hmm. to tell us about the quality of life for patients and how does this translate and what we choose to treat them. His goal mm -hmm. was not to be clear. His goal was to not be miserable. And clearing, unfortunately or fortunately, is the way you manage signs and symptoms of disease. You have to get their skin clear and you have to get those inflammatory cytokines that, that, are, that are feeding the itch component within the skin and the synovial fluid, uh, those cytokines that are found in both places, that is what causes stitch and an over itch and an overgrowth of skin cells and mm -hmm. increased blood flow into the area. And people will tell me they won't go out to lunch with their friends. They'll find out who's driving because they don't want to be in a car with someone who's got dark interior because they know when they get up, you'll see the flake everywhere. Yeah. It's, right. it's those things that you learn about people that you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're so miserable and living life in a way that we can make such a big impact. Well, I mean, and the, the, the good news about this is that the treatments we have available to us do address itch very nicely. Mm -hmm both the, the biologics and, and oral uh, primalas both, both do that. Now, the, all the trials uh, for, these, um, for these things, they didn't really set any primary endpoints at addressing the itch. The primary endpoints were looking at clearance. They are now. But, but as they've gone yeah. back and done a lot of po uh, post hoc analysis and have, and have initiated investor, investigator initiated trials, we're seeing that we not only see in practice that these, these uh, newer treatments are phenomenal at helping itch, but we're starting to see data is, is, is telling us that as well. And that kind of, I think, brings us to the next point about, well, what are, if they're itching and they're severe and severe in different areas and quality of life, you know, what are we doing? Uh, what's our experience with these, these biologics, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll give you my experience uh, quickly from the beginning, then people can kind of open up. Um, in Tanercept, uh, when Tanercept was approved for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, it was November 2nd, 1998. I remember the day because I put a patient on it. Mm -hmm. I was in internal medicine at the time in 98. And uh, I had a patient who wanted to be on it, came in, told me about it. I want to be on this medication. They educated me. Mm -hmm. 
and, and you were so, brave enough to And I said, let's do it. Forward. So yeah. we, we put them on it. So when you fast forward to 2004, when it finally got approved for uh, psoriasis, and by that time I had moved into dermatology, the internal medicine for two years, they came in to tell us about it. I said, oh, I've had 15 or 20 people on this medication already. And so I've had, I have a long track record of putting people on, on these biological medications uh, with, with the Tanercept and then all the ones that have come after that. Now, Tanercept was not the first TNF because Remicade actually was approved about three or four months prior to that in, in 1998. They're both getting their approval, not for psoriasis at that time, but in terms of hitting the market. And so when we look at our tissue necrosis factor inhibitors, we're looking at in Tanercept, Adelumab, which is Humira, and Infliximab, and then kind of the not new medication, but new to, newer to us in dermatology with the um, sertilizumab. Um, so these products have been great. We know that they're great for our joints and still carry that, have multiple indications. They do have uh, other, uh, some black box warnings that we have to look out for with those, those medications with infections and some cancers but uh, they're here to stay and they've been very helpful to us. As we move into the IL-2012-23s, 20, when Stolara kind of hit the market and brought us into that, used to Kenyumab, and then moved into the IL-17s. Mm -hmm. I followed on the footsteps of those. And then we kind of said, look, we don't need the 12, let's focus on the 23s, and that's, those have been the, the, the new kids on the block. What's exciting is over the last seven, eight years, we've had Biologic launched, FDA approved, every at least one per year for the last seven to eight years. Mm -hmm. So I know it's a lot, because now, now the pool, as you guys know, we now have 11. We have 11 that, uh, that we can choose from that are biologics, with almost all of them being monoclonal antibodies. And that's what the MAB at the end, secukinumab, MAB, means monoclonal antibody. And the only one that doesn't have the MAB at the end of it is intanercept, in Braille. Yeah. You know, and that's SEPT because that has a human fusion protein. So that's the only one that differs. Everyone else are monoclonal antibodies that have been launched, and we do have a few more on the horizon. But uh, I use all of them. Um, I see advantages to all of them, and we can talk about the peculiarities of what, what patients should go on which one, but I have a great comfort level with these because I see them changing people's lives in every aspect, mm -hmm. psychosocial, joint, itch, and we're going to see some data uh, potentially discuss that it may be helping with the other comorbidities, mm -hmm. improving those as well, and we can talk about that uh, a little bit too.